I was 13 when I first met him. Poor, confused, and hurting, but ambitious as hell, I wanted nothing more than to finish school and escape my poverty through gaining an education and with it a well-earning career. He saw this desperate desire for academic success and offered to parent and care for me while I worked on my studies. He said he wanted to help a mind that he saw going to waste. He groomed me, giving me many things I could only have dreamed of having while growing up in poverty, and manipulated me into moving into his spare room. He said he would help me overcome my mental struggles resulting from my abusive childhood, but sadly his own mental health issues made that impossible and his lessons quickly developed into an abuse of his own. When he began raping me, telling me it was to save me from teen pregnancy, I concluded that sacrificing my body was the price I was willing to pay to get away from poverty and to find someone to care. But after years of escalating abuse, I started running and trying to get away at the age of 19, finally succeeding by the age of 20. Though I initially didn't report him because I believed he had just made a lot of mistakes but wouldn't actually be a harm to anyone else. Only upon beginning my therapy journey did I slowly learn that his actions were actually caused by mental illness, and thus could impact others. And with that, I actually begged him to get treatment, but to my disappointment, he refused. So after a while of feeling powerless over the situation, I finally decided to report his abuse in hopes that it would cause him to recognize just how ill he really is and thus get help. But unfortunately, it didn't end up being nearly that simple. This is the story of my experience fighting my abusive, adoptive father through the Canadian courts. The case began in early June 2013, when I sat for over two hours in the London Police Department describing the abuse I had faced for more than half a decade of my life. After gathering further evidence, they concluded to charge him with sexual exploitation of a young person, assault, assault with a weapon, and sexual assault. A couple weeks later, they arrested him, but he was unfortunately released on bail due to the case being considered historical. I learned a short while later that they had actually confiscated his phone at some point and recovered a video of me being sexually assaulted. I was pretty distraught as I obviously never wanted anyone to ever see those recordings, but the officer informed me it would, in fact, be used in the case and played out in court. Knowing that was very hard on me, and it wasn't long before it was clear that he was going to make the whole process as painstaking and difficult as possible, fighting to delay each proceeding at every turn. He delayed setting a preliminary trial as long as he possibly could, continually claiming he hadn't had enough time to review evidence. Eventually, he was forced to pick a date, at which point February 24th, 2014 was chosen. But when that day arrived, he chose to forego the proceedings and go straight to trial, opting for a judge and jury because jury cases take longer to schedule, at which point a court date of April 27th, 2015 was set. But approximately a week before that date arrived, he presented a letter from an unqualified physiotherapist claiming he had gotten in a car accident so serious that his injuries prevented him from competently standing trial and thus requested an adjournment. To my devastation, this adjournment was granted, and a couple months later, the new trial date of March 14th, 2016 was set. The whole process had felt rather surreal for how slow everything seemed to have been moving, but as of February 24th, 2016, that feeling quickly faded as I found myself getting ready to meet with the Crown Attorney to finally begin preparing for the trial. I'm a little bit overwhelmed. I've uh, been crying a lot the last couple days in being overwhelmed at how quickly this day has come. I didn't want to get out of bed. I mostly, I want this over with but I also just don't want it to happen at all, <laughs> like anyone, I guess. So I'm anxious and all that jazz, but the Crown is, is a really nice person. I got the head Crown Attorney of London, is what I was told. Apparently, the way it works is that there are several Crown Attorneys within the city, because there's lots of cases, and then there's one head, and she delegates cases to other people. And she saw my case, and she was intrigued. So she decided to do it herself. So I guess in that sense, if she's head, I, I like to think I have one of the better, if not the best, lawyer in the city. So that's cool, I guess. And she's a really nice person, like I said. She's always been really compassionate and uh, understanding and sweet when interacting with me. So I'm not anxious by her or anything. It's more just like seeing her means the case is getting closer. And to add to my experience, I had to walk through freezing rain to get to the courthouse. 
I managed with the weather well enough, but my anxiety over the whole situation continually weighed down on my mood and overall mental state more and more with every step. I was like really dissociative and upset and starting to cry and just feeling very numb and awful when I first got to the courthouse and it was just like really weird to see all kinds of cops and like law officials and stuff chuckling and smiling and being all like giggly and happy and it's just like Ugh, how are you so happy in a profession like this dealing with people's lives like this like your life isn't falling apart it must be nice but anyways so uh, as soon as I saw her I started feeling better because I remembered her being a nice person and so like familiarity. Got to her office, started talking about everything and like where the defense is and what they're trying to do and how they're trying to argue some of the evidence because it was obtained from another case and they're trying to argue that in that case it was obtained illegally. And I'm also super anxious though because she told me that he's supposed to have met with his lawyer a few times now and he hasn't. He hasn't heard from him, doesn't know what's going on. So. That's anxiety filling because I'm just really worried he's going to postpone it again. Fingers crossed that the end of this video isn't me saying that he postponed it again. <laughs> but anyway, I'm feeling kind of neutral at the moment, like, I don't know, now that that's over, like, I was really upset before and just like freaking out, like, I can't believe this day is here. Now this day is over, that seems to keep happening, days are going by really fast. And I just want it over with. And before I knew it, the next 14 days were gone and I was being expected back at the courthouse again. So I'm heading to court, it's March 9th and I'm going to watch the videos that I made three years ago to testify. I'm nervous as hell, I've been having chronic nausea for the last few days. They actually told me a couple days ago it was going to be rescheduled uh, to a week later, which freaked the hell out of me, but that didn't happen, so. I'm gonna go watch those videos. I really didn't expect reviewing the interview would be so bad, despite my nerves, but in the end, I came to find it much harder than I anticipated. I struggled quite a bit at certain points, but was told that reviewing my statement was necessary to properly prepare for the trial, so I did the best I could to watch it to the end. I then went to speak with the Crown about where the case was sitting and anything else I needed to know to be ready for the proceedings. She explained to me what I'm going to have to be doing and that is retelling everything. She said that basically, because it's a judge only situation, or it's probably the same with the jury, but anyways, the way it works is they don't see any of the evidence beforehand. All they see is the charge, the paper that says the charge. And uh, then she pulls the witnesses up to the stand one by one. Me first, because I'm going to be setting the stage. That's what she said. <laughs> so I'll be first, and then I'll probably be going up again, but everybody will be going up in between. And she's basically going to be asking me things and making me retell the whole story, and the judge won't have heard it through, like, all the testimony that I've already made. So he re-elected for no jury, thank God, and they're not going to be using the video that they have of, uh, that they found on his phone, so that's a relief, which is the reason they were going to postpone it, to, like, sort that out, so... They're not postponing it, it's going on. They're not using that evidence, which is really nice to know. Tomorrow, like, everything's being official, and they're just like, yes, we're ready to go, so the Crown's gonna text me tomorrow and verify everything, and then it'll go forward. I don't know, she said I seemed a lot sadder, which is weird, because I don't remember being that happy last time I talked to her, but I guess I'm just, like, dealing with the nausea. It's kind of coming and going. I'm nervous. I'm also really, really numb. Mostly just numb. Mostly just numb but uh, working on it. I'm gonna get a haircut tomorrow and fix my hair so I don't look like crap. And uh, otherwise, just trying to not freak out. Nervous and anxious aren't even close to describing. I had felt a great deal of support in knowing I wasn't alone in testifying, with the other witnesses being the people who had helped me get away from him. But still, the panic I faced in the next few days was more than I had ever faced before. Even in the abusive times when I was afraid I might die, I still hadn't ever faced as much fear as what I had on the night of March 13th, 2016, and I really wasn't feeling any better the next morning either. I can't really put into words how scared I am right now. I don't even know why. I don't necessarily have reason to be afraid, because I'm just telling the truth of what happened, but I'm scared. I've been scared for a while. I've been sick as fuck. I've been throwing up and having a hard time eating. I've never experienced so much fear, even in the middle of being abused. I have never experienced as much fear and terror as I went through yesterday. 
in the pending. Today is the day of. It's the morning. I'm shaking. They've told me that basically I'm just going up to set the stage as I mentioned. So the first day is basically just me testifying and saying what happened. And then the next days are going to be people confirming my story. The other witnesses that they got. I think I've gotten numb because I'm not as scared as I was yesterday. I didn't really understand why people were calling me brave to have done this until the terror that I faced yesterday. And then I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I guess it sort of makes sense to be called brave when you have to face this. But uh, interesting thing, my lovely other half, Shane, introduced me to Minecraft just a few days ago. And it's been a great distraction. It's really taken me out of this world and put me into another one, Minecraft. And so it's helped me not be sick. It's helped me not freak out over the last couple of days because I've just been building my own little house and my own little caves and mining and all that stupid shit. So yeah, yay Minecraft. Anyways, just getting ready now. I'm gonna walk there. She's there with me the whole time. Anytime he leaves in the last week, I've kind of had panic attacks, so he's kind of not been leaving my side. And uh, I've been so spacey, I haven't been able to remember literally anything. My brain is gone. I've never had such a gone brain. <sighs> I just want this over with. The dissociation I was dealing with was so intense that walking to the courthouse this particular time was more dreamlike than ever. I couldn't believe this day had finally arrived. I was so afraid of the absolute worst happening, though oddly, my ability to feel it was steadily diminishing the closer I got to the courthouse. I think I'm really numb because I'm not scared for some reason. I was expecting to be terrified at this point. Here we go. So I walked in through the metal detectors up to the victim witness office and then sat, waiting anxiously to hear what was next. Unfortunately, it was unsettling news of him claiming to have had some kind of fall the day before, and I didn't handle it very well. He did exactly what I expected, and put in a medical bullshit thing to uh, try to be excused and adjourn it again like he did last year. I'm like shaking like crazy. The numbness went away, but the judge didn't accept it. She wanted more medical evidence, which they say is a good sign. So we're gonna come back tomorrow for hopefully things to move forward. And though my mental state had fluctuated between numbness and panic attacks rather often up to this point, thankfully things started to calm down a bit for me the next day. And so begins day two. I'm a lot calmer than yesterday because I know sort of what I'm anticipating, a whole bunch of waiting and then I've already seen him, so like that's kind of over with and I'm less anxious about that. But I'm still anxious because, as I mentioned, he is trying to postpone it again and I'm really afraid that he's gonna succeed and I'm gonna freak the fuck out. Basically what happened yesterday is we walked in, the Crown and the police officer came and spoke to me and told me that he was trying to postpone it again, at which point I started to like get really anxious and freak out uh, more and they're like, but we're gonna fight it. So they like went upstairs to like get ready in the courtroom and I just kind of broke down <laughs> and freaked out. And it's kind of funny because Shane was trying to comfort me, but I just like was pushing him away and wouldn't let him. I was very resistant to being comforted. I'm not sure why, but I was just so upset about having this to go longer. So after that, we went upstairs and I had the option, like they were like, do you want to be there? Cause you don't have to, you could sit there. You don't have to. And I kind of didn't at first. So I was like, I'll just sit in a room outside of the court room a witness room or whatever but then I was sitting there and I was getting more and more upset about how he's trying to postpone it again and I hadn't seen him in so long and I was like fuck it I want him to see me and maybe that'll make him stop trying to postpone this but of course he didn't really look at me when he was in the courtroom but I went in and so I finally saw him after a long time and putting on his sick act and uh, started getting more and more upset with him and just that he's doing this and they presented their stuff their bullshit about him being ill and they say it's a minor victory because she said that she needed more evidence so she's considering his thing trying to be fair but she's also saying it's he hasn't provided enough to prove it so i'm like well the fact that she's considering it all is upsetting but apparently it's a minor victory so he then left the courtroom and then we left the courtroom after and we went downstairs and he was like right there when we were walking to victim witness and so like my heart was racing and i'm just thinking about like all the things i wanted to say to him I wanted to walk like right up to him and just start talking to him, but I knew that wasn't appropriate. So after I like finished going to the washroom and everything, Shane and I walked out of the victim witness office area and like he was like right off to the left. So we just kind of kept walking. He was down looking at his phone and I just kind of really, really wanted to say something. And so <clears throat> I just said, if you're trying to hurt me, you are. And I looked him right in the eye and I hadn't looked him in the eye in years. And so that was 
quite something. I think it's maybe why I'm not so anxious anymore is because I've done that now. But anyway, and then I just kept walking and he just kind of had this like dazed, shocked look in his eye, but same eyes, same cold eyes. Went from there and just kind of been playing Minecraft and freaking out less and less because I'm like not scared about this anymore. I mostly just want it over with. The only fear is that he's going to try and postpone it. So that's today. Just about going to find that out and then proceeding with everything. Or at least hopefully proceed with everything. But as I walked into the courthouse yet again, my ability to believe that such a scenario was possible continued to dwindle. So I guess as expected, he presented a letter from a doctor saying he could not attend court because he has neurological issues or brain issues or whatever the fuck. It's all a bunch of bullshit. It's from a doctor he hasn't seen in months. And we can't even tell if he's claiming this brain injury was from a, a fall on Sunday or something previous. And if it was from something previous, why hadn't he presented it before? He said he was ready for court. So I'm really, really upset. But the judge gave me a little bit of hope in that she said that she was skeptical of his stuff too. So they're giving him until Thursday to present more valid stuff, saying that he's not fit to be tried or whatever the fuck. But in the meantime, I just kind of have to wait and have everything constantly put off. So I'm not entirely sure what's next, but we'll find out on Thursday. Though I did still have to survive through Wednesday too, which was quite difficult, but honestly would have been a lot harder if not for Shane introducing me to Minecraft. And with it, I engaged in avoidance-based coping where instead of thinking about the real world and my real fear, I focused much more on my Minecraft world, and in that sense, my Minecraft therapy. Been mostly what I've been spending my time on in between the trial of the first few days, which looks like it's going to be weeks and months later, but... This is what I've kept myself sane with. Yay, Minecraft. <laughs> but even though I found some level of relief in keeping myself busy with gaming during the day, my mind was left completely free at night to run rampant and worry me sick. I watched each hour pass, exhausted but wide awake. Begins day three. What should have been day four, but is day three of like, fuck knows, weeks and weeks by this point. Still feeling sick. So it's Thursday and we're going in. We didn't, I didn't have to go in, but I wanted to because it's the last time that I think in a while I'm going to have a chance to be in the courthouse and like legally near him and I, man, I want to give him a piece of my mind and I'm not going to because I know it's not a good idea, but I want to. So I'm just going in to like find out in person and to be there in person to see if he comes up with a legitimate excuse for being medically unable to participate in the trial or not. I'm gonna head in soon and find out his bullshit. And as I walked to the courthouse, I wondered to myself what he could have possibly told this doctor to get her to help with this postponement. Does she even know anything about my case or has he just pawned this off as some silly traffic infringement? I have no idea and the thought drives me insane as I anticipate the worst, though thankfully it actually went better than expected this time. Like 95% sure that it was going to be case managed and it was going to be put off for months and months, but the judge like didn't believe him at all. We talked to the Crown right away and then we went up with her and he provided another letter from the doctor who was like, he has brain injuries, but there was no tests, no evidence, just a letter from the doctor. So he was just like, sorry man, too little too late, too little evidence, too late. So we're proceeding on Monday. I actually hadn't cried at all up to that point, I was shaking a lot in the courtroom. And as soon as he said, no, this is going ahead on Monday, sorry man, I just I burst into tears out of relief. It's kind of crazy. So anyway, I guess that's gonna happen. I wasn't excited to once again spend the weekend anxiously awaiting Monday, but I did feel a lot better with how everything had proceeded that day. It was a different judge seeing over everything due to limited availability, and one of the things he said while making his decision was, Sir, this does not look like health issues. This looks like cowardice. And I will forever appreciate a judge being so bold as to say that, considering how hard these delays continued to be on me. So I spent the weekend basically just minecrafting with a few emotional breakdowns in between. I'm fully expecting to find out that there's been some kind of medical emergency and he's like fallen downstairs or done something crazy and is in the hospital. And if that doesn't happen, I fully expect him to fall during the trial now. So like, I'm just all anxious about that. But otherwise my health is actually a lot better. I'm not shaking or anything like that. Just can't eat and such. But anyway, it's almost time to leave. So we're gonna get going, head to the courthouse and find out 
what today will bring. Is it going to be a trial or is it not going to be a trial? And this time as I walked in, I basically completely put out of my mind the possibility of having to testify or be on stand at all for that matter. It was actually rather distant from my thoughts as I found myself fully consumed with what possible thing he could do next to try and delay it yet again. But shortly after walking into the victim witness office, everything took a turn in a both predictable and yet unexpected direction. The Crown just came in and told me that he's decided to enter a guilty plea because so one of my predictions is that he didn't want me to go on stand. So it's not the worst prediction. He's not hospitalized and he's not suicidal or anything like that. But in entering a guilty plea, this means that he'll probably get less time and he won't be charged with all of the charges that were laid. So that's a little bit frustrating because it means he won't spend as much time getting help. And it means he gets a couple more months to like order his affairs before everything's finally concluded. So this is still like an open thing for another couple months, which is frustrating. But anyway, it's not like official yet. They're up in the courtroom right now deciding everything and the details and stuff. Once it was all worked out, they took another brief break before he actually did the plea, and I then learned that he was, in fact, only being charged with half of the original charges. At this point, it occurred to me that he had always intended to plea in order to get as reduced a sentence as possible, but he just proceeded with the trial process to postpone the sentencing as long as he possibly could. This forced me to realize just how little the family I thought we had actually meant to him, and broke my heart in a whole new way. So, I just went and listened to him plead guilty to those two charges. And then they read out like some of the details of what I'd reported, which was interesting. And then two random people walked into the courtroom during that, which was very uncomfortable. And I'm all like, who are you? Why are you here? Why are you listening to this? But anyway, it was really interesting to hear him plead guilty to those things. And then, I don't know, I was shaking the whole time, but I'm okay now. And they've put it all off for the sentencing to be in a couple months, June 6th, which is very frustrating for me because that means this video and everything is postponed until then, but such is the way it is. There was 11 weeks until the next hearing, apparently due to the overseeing judge being from out of town this time. And considering there was such a large waiting period until the sentencing, I was told to take my time in writing my impact statement, though in retrospect, I honestly feel I should have started right away. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done, and with that, took much longer than expected to finish, due to the exceptional emotional and psychological agony that ended up being involved. I also had to physically bring it into the courthouse too, which wasn't a pleasant experience. I hate going to the courthouse if I hadn't mentioned that before. The person I always see when I go there is named Lisa and she's really nice, but I just get so dissociative that I, I feel like an ass. But I didn't really see her, I just dropped off the paperwork because I saw her last time because this is actually dropping off an edited copy because I dropped off the original last week. It took me forever to write that statement. I intend to do a video on it, it was really hard. I'm not looking forward to reading it, but at the same time it has a purpose. After dropping it off, I was informed they needed to review the statement to ensure it was legally submittable, and if there was any issues, they would contact me. The Crown has informed me via text that she's just gonna call me in a few minutes to let me know what parts of my statement that she doesn't feel are submittable. And I guess we get to discuss that. I fully intend to argue, of course, but then again, I recognize I'm not a professional lawyer, so I don't know like what's legal and what's not. But at the same time, like I don't understand why parts of it aren't submittable, especially since I didn't testify, and so thus I haven't fucking said anything in the court fucking room. <laughs> and the impact statement is supposed to be validating, right? So like, I guess we're gonna argue about this, but she's a really nice person, so it's not gonna be like, you know, I'm not mad with her, I just need to understand. So, I figure, I guess I'll record that conversation, at least my end of it, and possibly fast forward through it if it's boring to listen to, but just let you guys see the emotions of that wonderful, joyful mess. And uh, we'll go from there. Private number. It's always private number. <clears throat> Hello. Anybody who ever wants to tell me that the court system in Canada doesn't treat the defendant fairly can go fuck themselves. It's been over three years since I reported 
what I've been through. And it took me almost three years from getting out of the abuse to be able to do it. Because it was hard. You don't understand what it means to not have parents. And then to have someone offer to be your parent. But take everything from you. And yet still love you more than anyone ever has. You just... And ultimately I'm reporting him to get him help because he's ill. And I'm being made to wait and wait and wait. So, even though I thought Monday was the sentencing hearing, it's not. Going in Monday to figure out what we're submitting for the sentencing hearing. And then having another date picked, hopefully in June, to have the sentencing made. I'm just a trinket, an ornament, a little element or detail of this stupid court process. In the end, it's actually all about the defendant, and when they plea, they're considered entirely remorseful and treated thusly. And when it's in an intense federal whatever the bullshit case like this, they're given all the fucking chances that they want to defend themselves. All the chances in the world. And with this new delay, any and all faith I may have had in the legal system was lost. Monday, June 6th. Now, they want to refine the statement in take out whatever parts they don't feel are appropriate. So I'm just gonna ask to rewrite it all together and actually add some parts that I know won't be removed. But anyway, I'm heading into the courthouse to basically wait around for the Crown to like go pick another date and figure out the statement with the Crown. Though the day actually ended up being a bit more eventful than expected. I actually ended up going in the courtroom and seeing him. It's sort of anxiety filling, but it's becoming less anxiety filling, I guess, each time, so it wasn't so bad. It was really brief. So basically, he walked in, he was standing there already, he said to the judge, We're not ready to go ahead, there's issues with the pre sentencing report, and we want to dispute over the impact statement. But, anyways, June 30th is the next date when he will finally actually be sentenced. In the meantime, I just went and spoke with the Crown and we talked about all the different things he's disputing and the changes that she wants me to make to my statement. Basically, in my original statement, in never getting to testify, I s tried to list just the very specific three times that I remember thinking he was going to kill me. And uh, I wanted to say those things to the judge because I felt they were impactful and I just never got to testify and I'm frustrated by that now that he made me hold on to all those memories and the judge doesn't get to hear about it. So. I tried that, but she said it's just not admissible. For one, because some of the things I didn't even remember to testify about, and you can't submit things that haven't already been in pre-submitted statements, because then they can't defend against it or whatever. And then for two, you're just supposed to mainly be talking about your impact, not the details of what happened. So I'm going to go and revamp that and try and condense those paragraphs into the impact of those times instead of the specific times and what happened. Which is frustrating, but you know, whatever. I'm also gonna edit and add in some other like explanations, further explanations of impact, which will be good, I guess. And uh, submit that tonight. She gave me her email, so I finally don't have to print it again, which is nice. And she also explained to me that he is petitioning to be a Métis and is saying he wants to be considered as part of something to do with the Gladu decision, which is a thing where they basically say this is Native American of Canada and they must be given special consideration for the poverty that they faced and the residential schools and all of the mental health issues that they've had. And all that needs to be taken into consideration when considering their trial. And though I'm really glad to hear that stuff like that exists in Canadian law, he never personally learned it in family. He, like, pursued it on his own. And it's just full of shit. He's grasping at every little straw he possibly can to try and get his sentence reduced. And though I agree he deserves a level of consideration for his mental illness, he's done what he's done, he's not native, and he's being ridiculous. So that's frustrating. But that's another thing he's doing. And they're also arguing details saying that, like, I can't prove that he ran up my credit card, so I shouldn't mention that, which is bullshit. And I can't prove that his abuse caused my anxiety, so I shouldn't mention that, which is bullshit. But those are just, like, little detail arguments that I can still talk about, and he'll just, like, maybe cross-examine me about it. Well, whatever, go ahead. 
jerk. <laughs> so anyways, I'm gonna go home and revamp the impact statement again and then email it to her tonight. And then uh, hopefully it will be submittable and on June 30th I will finally go to the courthouse and read it out and he will be sentenced and figure out where everything goes from there. Yay to yet another month of waiting. Such is life though, right? And though I did send her a revised copy right away, I endlessly found myself dissatisfied with it and obsessing throughout the month over possible changes. So it is June 18th. I contacted the Crown a couple days ago to ask her if I could send in a revised vi uh, version again of my statement because I just continually keep coming up with more and more new stuff because that's the reality of a fucking traumatic brain is there's different types of trauma but it's just really fucking hard in complex PTSD in events that are historical or that are over a period of time you're not just assaulted once but like it's the way you live for an extended period of time when you're in that type of abuse it's just it's fucking impossible to recall it all at once impossible and so I guess a little segment of advice I'd give to anyone in this position having tried an impact statement is no matter what they say get on it right away start on it immediately start jotting down different events that you remember because I didn't do that and I regret it I regret it a lot because there's just I've got a good list of like half a dozen or more things already since I submitted my statement last Monday now that I would love to include and that would be really impactful if the judge heard. I mean, if, if someone actually gets to testify, maybe that's a different situation because then the judge heard everything that you went through plus the impact statement. That's, that's a bit different. But in my case, like, the impact statement is it. That's it. And then, like, a few facts read out that were summarized from the officer who took the statement. And no offense to her at all, but just that fact summary is just peanuts <laughs> to what I went through. And you just can't get a real grasp of the day-to-day -day torture that I experienced without, you know, me directly saying, sharing about it. And even though I'm a lot happier with my revised statement, because I had a lot of opportunity to put a lot more into it than I did originally, I would love to revise it again. And so even though it's not really advised to submit it until after there's been a verdict, I still advise you start writing it right away. Or at least start taking notes of different events that you can remember when you've been through extended abuse and then use those notes to write your statement when you get to it so right now i'm actually honestly drinking trying to emotionally cope with the fact that i'm really not going to be satisfied with my statement in the end i'm not going to be happy with giving it because it's just peanuts in itself in all the effort I put into it it's still nothing compared to what I've been through and it's so frustrating that I don't get to testify and actually tell the judge what I faced after all this fucking torture that I'm just going absolutely crazy trying to deal with waiting for the 30th and trying to deal with the fact that I really don't get to have my statement be what I want it to be. I had unfortunately drank more in the time I was trying to write my statement than I ever had before and I knew it wasn't smart, but in the end, the mental anguish was just so deep that a few beers to calm myself and break the suicidal, self-loathing thoughts just didn't seem so bad at the time, though I soon learned there was a lot more coping still to be had. He's changed lawyers. Basically tomorrow is not happening at all, and we're gonna go in on the 12th of July to see who his new counsel is. So I'm just really angry. I guess. I don't even know the motions to explain. I feel very numb, ultimately very angry. So now I'm just going to spend the next few weeks dying and then the next few weeks after that dying and then eventually hopefully I'll be dead and everything will be fine. At least that's how I feel. So continues the torture story. Will there be an end? At this point I was genuinely questioning how much longer I was going to be able to withstand the situation. Facing such an uncertain future continually put new pressures on my depression and overall mental state. It's July 12th, a little bit surprised I made it this far. Honestly been more suicidal in the last little while than I think ever. It's just, life is feeling so goddamn empty and pointless and I just feel like this is my life now, getting dragged through this fucking system. Unfortunately broke and self-harmed even because I've just been pretty ready for death. But it's July 12th, here we are. 
I'm heading in. Mary, the crown, isn't even gonna actually be there, but she said it's just administrative. They're just supposed to be reassigning him another lawyer and picking another date or something like that. So walking in there right now to just sit around basically and wait for that. And it might take a while, they told me, but I'm like, whatever, I just wanna go. I don't have to be there, but I wanna go so I can find out the next date as soon as possible. So I can know when the next time is he's going to try to postpone it. I'm not looking forward to it at all. But let's be real. What part of this have I ever looked forward to? Who would look forward to something like this? So despite my attempts to anticipate how long this hearing might take, it still ended up being much longer than expected. Since 9.30, they've already taken one break. 20 minute break. Apparently they're usually only 15. Now it's one o'clock in the afternoon and they're taking an hour lunch. I don't advise anyone attend administrative court if they don't have to. They don't tell you when you're coming up or when your case is coming up. You just get to sit and wait. And it didn't get any better from there either. God. There are not words. There are not words for how mad I am, for how frustrated. Oh my fucking God. It's 20 to three in the afternoon and I just got told that I'm here for nothing. Basically, once the lunch hour ended, I stopped the crown that's representing Mary just before he went in the uh, room and I asked him, you know, I've been here all day. Is there some way you can see my case sooner rather than later? And he was like, yeah, sorry, Mary told me you were coming. Uh, it's just been a crazy day. There's been so much going on. So I guess this is a busier than usual day, lovely. And he said he's gonna try and see about the matter right away. So he brought it up first thing when the judge got in. And they looked at it and they're like, well, he's not here. And there doesn't seem to be anybody representing him. So at first they were starting to talk about issuing a bench warrant, which got me stupid excited. And then they put it aside because they couldn't read the writing of the past judge. Lovely. Shouldn't it be a requirement that they can write if they're gonna be a fucking judge? I don't know. Anyways, so they put it aside, started seeing several other matters, then they came back to it, and then they decided that the matter was set for the 15th, and I'm here by mistake. I can't quite tell if they decided that it wasn't communicated right that day, or what happened, but my crown had it written down as the 12th, corrected from the 15th, and the judge apparently never made that change. So I was sitting in court from 9.30 a.m. until 2.40 for nothing. But the judge did directly apologize to me because he could see, I mean, I wasn't hiding it. I was fucking upset. And I was just like, thanks for wasting my day, guys. And uh, the judge was just like, I'm very sorry, ma'am. We're gonna try and get this sorted out as soon as we can. And he like directly addressed me. And so I said, you know, it's okay. I understand, no problem. Although that was a total lie. It's a complete problem. Of course it's a problem, <laughs> but there's not a whole lot that can be done. So I'm gonna go home. Try not to kill myself for the next few days. Wish me luck. Can't believe I came here for nothing. Day for the courts wasting my time even more. Ain't it lovely? How many times have I said that in this video so far? Anyway, so onward until the 15th, I guess. At this point, I was starting to feel that everything that could go wrong would, leaving suicide never far from my thoughts. My 15th, I'm still alive. I really wish I wasn't, but you know, anyways, heading to the courthouse, hopefully I won't be there forever. And I get to find out when the next date is that he's gonna try and postpone. Something I found really funny that I forgot to mention last time is, I don't know why, I didn't care to look it up, but I just was laughing at the fact that in the official crest of Canada, we have unicorns. And I know Scotland's official thing is unicorns, which I still find hilarious, but it's just not a real animal, so I find it funny. <laughs> so official and we have unicorns. But anyway, off we go to court again to hate ourselves. Though despite my expectations, I actually found myself in and out of the courtroom rather quickly this time. I just learned that today isn't any kind of assignment court. It happens once a week. It's just the judge messed up and somehow thought it was on Friday and so they gave him that forgiveness. I shouldn't be here right now. This all should have happened on Tuesday. But anyway, oh, I'm shaking, I'm so anxious. It was the same judge as uh, Tuesday, and it's the judge who called him a coward. So that's good. He didn't have a representative. I now learned that he purposely dropped his lawyer. He was the one who decided he didn't want him anymore. So, God, 
driving me crazy. He walked up and claimed that the person he's trying to retain right now, Ron Ellis or whatever, was on vacation. And it's like, well, why didn't he send an agent to represent him then? It's, as far as any communication has been able to discern, he hasn't been retained. He's not your lawyer. And I'm thinking, well, maybe this guy is like sketchy on the case and is like, well, you know, I'll consider retaining you when I get back from holidays, but no at this point. And he's trying to drag it out by being like, oh, he's on holidays, but we're trying to retain him. And when he comes back, please give us another month. And it's just like, fuck you. <laughs> so the judge was like, no, th nope, this has been going long, too long, too long. We're setting a sentencing date. I don't care if you have representation. It's too long. So they said September 2nd or 23rd. So I was like anxious, ring in my hands, had my hands up by my mouth. I was so upset. I was just like, pick the second, pick the second, which is still fucking six weeks from now or more, which piss off to me. But still, I'm like, pick the sooner date, please pick the sooner date. So they call around to make sure availability. Then they ask me, they're like, do either of those dates work for you? And I'm like, I really prefer the second. <laughs> so they're like, strong preference to the second. Mary was available. So they got the second. <sighs> Another fucking six weeks or some of trying to live through this limbo. I'm so done with all this. The worst part about this for me is every single court date, I lose sleep the night before. I basically don't sleep. So here's hoping that September 2nd is the last time I lose sleep. Cross your fingers for me. It was May 2013 when I first reported this. When will it end? The constant limbo had my head spinning with endless, conflicting emotions, fears, and anxieties, and in the next six weeks, that only got worse. Feeling obsessed over my inability to convey just how agonizing this all had been and is being on me, I proceeded to rewrite and resubmit my impact statement one more time. Rewriting it was incredibly draining, once again, but having to cope with the parts that were removed was honestly a lot harder, and dealing with the anxiety of wondering what antics he might try next really didn't make it any easier. Not so good, uh, apparently he hasn't yet done anything. I mean but it's only 8.30 in the morning. I'm a lot less nervous than I have been in previous days that this was supposed to happen. I guess I'm just so used to it now. I'm just like, it's not gonna happen. It's just, it's just not going to. Oh yeah, also, I came to realize, like it clicked in the shower last night and I started bawling because I realized that she basically took out all of the most impactful physical impacts that I, he had on me, like all of the really bad physical things that are left over, the scars, the broken tooth, mutilated genitalia, for example, those were all taken out. And that's really upsetting to me. So I've told her that I need to speak with her about that this morning before we go ahead. I'm gonna try to be calm and understanding. It's just like, to a certain degree, why can't I say that he broke my tooth? He did, so we'll see. I'm gonna go talk to her about that. And though I did speak with the Crown once we arrived at the courthouse, she insisted no further changes were possible because the blacked out version had already been submitted to the judge. This, along with further delays, weighed heavily on my mind, but I actually came out feeling rather conflicted because other areas of the case did manage to move forward as well. I saw that Mary was actually talking to him in the courtroom, so went in and saw that he was trying to make claims about having a lawyer or someone was supposed to be coming to represent him or something like that, and he was like, I don't know, saying that someone should be downstairs or whatever representative, and then the person that he was talking about ended up calling him on the phone right then and there. And he handed the phone to Mary to talk to the person. And it basically got determined that like, within the last few days, he had contacted this person to try and retain them. And it was really short notice. And so like, he was basically looking to adjourn it because he still didn't have a lawyer. And was claiming that it was legal aids taking forever to process his thing or whatever, whatever. All a bunch of bullshit delays again. Trying to claim that he didn't get a lawyer when he never really tried. So, I don't know. That basically didn't move forward. What they determined was that the legal aid certificate was indeterminate. They don't know if it's going to come through or not because he has a lot of assets or whatever. And the person that he's talking about won't even like look at him or his or the case or anything until he knows he has a legal aid certificate. So it's all waiting on that. And the judge was like, "Too bad, you know, this has been going on too long, and you waited too long to process that." But if you guys remember, I mentioned that he had brought up something about the glad do Métis report. <sighs> Canadian law frustrates me. So in the end, the judge happened to notice that it was within the pre-sentencing report and was like, why hasn't this been addressed yet? And Mary was like, well, this is kind of the first I'm hearing of it in court. There is no report that I know of. And so he tried to go on about how he was going to get the report, blah, blah, blah. And the judge is like, this is out of your hands. This isn't something that you do. 
there's an office that does it and, and they make the report, blah, blah, blah. So in the end, he acknowledged that I'd been to like every single proceeding and that it was really like fucking with my life. So he said that he wanted to move forward with the impact statement happening and me reading it today, but the whole proceeding wasn't moving forward because they wanted to verify this Gladu report thing and whether it impacted anything or not. So in the end, I read my impact statement. It was brutal, to say the least. Starting it, I was bawling. All the way through of it, I was shaking. And it was really annoying because it was so long. Like, I was, I was pretty done with it after the third page, and there's like 11 pages. But I went through with it. And on a number of occasions, I actually like looked up at him and made eye contact with him and was like talking to him and it was interesting. As I was told, it was rather cathartic to do the statement just, just to see his reaction to some of the things I said, honestly, more than anything. I mostly hated reading it, it was terrible, but seeing his reaction was a big deal. He was very emotional. He was also full of denial too. So now it's September 2nd and they've decided to put things forward to the next week that the judge will be around, which is September, uh, the week of September 26th. The 30th is what they chose, which I hate them for. But one way or another, the next date to determine if the Métis Gladu report thing is going forward is the 30th. And then once they confirm that on the 30th, they will set yet another date to actually finish the sentencing hearing. But anyway, in some senses today move forward. In other senses, the court case carries on. But, but I feel a lot better doing my statement, so there's that. I walked away feeling more conflicted than ever that day, because I honestly was relieved to have the reading of my statement over, but the fact that the proceedings themselves were still dragging on weighed on me with an intensity that is simply indescribable and incomparable. So it's the 30th, don't even know what to say anymore. The video was not supposed to be this long. That's what I want to say. I already know what's going to happen. Last week, I text the Crown and she explained to me that he provided more information to the Gladu report writer, and there's one for this region, by the way, which is absurd. But with that, he's provided her information, and so she's going to try to write the report, because that's the responsibility of someone claims heritage to try to write the report. So we go into court just to tell the judge that, yeah, because he's claimed heritage, in Canadian courts, they take you at your word, and they do it anyways and they're gonna waste court time writing him a report claiming that his childhood was somehow affected by Aboriginal upbringings. Canadian courts, what garbage. I don't know why I'm still here. But anyway, on with it. The weather seemed to perfectly match my mental state that day, pouring down on me as I once again walked to the courthouse in a mess of frustration. And it's being put forward to an unknown date. The assignment court is going to be October 11th. They said I don't have to go, but I'm going to anyways because I want to know when the next date is. But the judge ever so eloquently stated that he has no known date to be in London after November 17th. And so he could not pick a date and thus he will make his schedule known to the courts and then they will pick a date on October 11th. It has to be after November 17th because the Gladue report writer said that she needs until at least November 17th to write his report, but still don't really know what's gonna happen with all this and I kinda just wanna die, I'm so done with it. I started this wanting to help someone and now I just feel so hated, but anyway. Mary shared that apparently he's claimed to the reporter that he was even in residential schooling, not just that he's got Aboriginal heritage and it somehow impacted his childhood, but that he was in it. It's just like, are you fucking kidding me? You showed me where your elementary schools were. In the middle of Timmins, it was a public school. And he ended up coming out of the elevator while we were talking, which was kind of what I intended, to be completely honest, because I wanted to yell at him. I didn't yell at the judge like I wanted to, but I did yell at him and told him that I knew he was a liar. And it was funny because Mary said, well, it's fine, as long as she's not yelling at me which made me feel ashamed that I've yelled at her. Emotions happen when you're learning the law the hard way. Anyway, and so it continues. So it's October 11th. This period of wait wasn't as long because, well, it quite literally wasn't as long and it didn't feel as long, but my depression has thankfully lifted a bit. I guess I'm just coming to terms with some stuff, finally accepting certain things about this whole situation and it's helping me with my depression, so that's good, I guess. 
But uh, anyways, just one thing that I did want to supplement. A little bit more interesting detail to the overall, I don't know, experience of reading my impact statement. Something I thought was really funny. I've been up on a, a stand before for the uh, case when I was a child, when I was molested. Uh, the chair was a lot more comfy in the Peel region. Here in London, they gave me a fucking hardwood stool. <laughs> And I like just sort of sat on the edge of it and the judge kind of looked at it and was like, is that all we have to give her? Are you sure that's okay? <laughs> Which I thought was kind of funny, but mm, deal. And then they were like, do you have a copy of the statement? I was like, no, I fully anticipated that you'd give me a copy. If I had a copy, I'd read out the parts blacked out that you don't want me to read. <laughs> so you should give me your copy. I really badly wanted to like, as I was reading it out, be like, and here's a big blank spot that I'm not allowed to read about in terms of my physical abuse, but I didn't say that out loud. But I did cry a fuck ton. Like I cried so much more than I expected. I guess because like I practiced it once or twice so like I had moments of crying and I knew that those intense moments might happen again but like I cried right away and then I was like crying a lot from the start and there was moments of dry up but I just cried a lot more than I anticipated because it's different reading it out to the person that it's basically written for versus just writing it and reading it to yourself I guess. So there was lots of crying which led to lots of snot one of the most difficult things to do is read through tears. You try looking through water while reading. It don't work. <laughs> and then imagine goober coming down your face the whole time. There was actually a moment of like me talking and a goober just being like bloop. <laughs> and I had to like schnoober with the, the, the schnot rag, you know. Yeah, it was, it was not pretty. And so that ended up in there being like, I used all of what was left in one of the t Kleenex boxes and I like sort of turned to the judge and was like, can I use that? And he had like a Kleenex box there and he was like, yeah, sure. So I just like took it and put it on my section. And then I had like a heaping pile <laughs> of Kleenex at the end and they just like had me stuff it in a box and leave it. And then they insisted that I take the box that I had taken from the judge with me to go sit down. And I was just like, I can just take a few, but okay, I guess I'll take the box and then deal with this later. But anyway, the other thing that I forgot to mention that was somewhat a really interesting detail was that in the end, when I got down and I went and sat back down, he like, behaved sort of comatose. He like tuned out. He wasn't listening. He had this like shocked look on his face of like staring off into space and just utter like disbelief, I guess. Main thing, like I said before, you can never know if he was acting or not, which drives me crazy. Just ugh. don't know because he's being watched and he's not a stupid man. He knows that the amount of remorse he shows impacts his overall sentence. So who knows if he's acting or if he actually feels. He seemed to have emotions about the whole situation, but like the judge tried to address him three times, four times, and everyone was just staring at him. Everyone in the room was just like, when you gonna acknowledge us? And I was just like, oh, I was on edge. I'm just like, mm -hmm. I was just about to like spew out his full name. Like, you know, like a mother does when they're pissed or something. But I didn't. He finally was just like, what, what, sorry, you're talking to me? Like, decided to acknowledge the last minute of reasonability. So anyway, kind of hilarious, because I mean, it, like I said, it was cathartic, but like, here we are, over a month later, still in fucking court. So I'm basically nervous as fuck, just wondering, am I gonna go find out that it's in 2017? Fully anticipating it. And what a ridiculous vlog this will become, <laughs> if it goes that long. And though the next date didn't end up being the worst case scenario, it still wasn't scheduled within any reasonable time span either, like every other rescheduling thus far. Surprise, surprise. They actually set it for December. I mean, let's be real, I'd really prefer November, but anyway, he said December 12th. And he wasn't there, by the way. <laughs> I was sitting there for like an hour and a half or so again. It wasn't nearly as bad as last time though. They did it before the first break. Thank fucking God. Also learned his new representative is named Mr. Seaman. <laughs> Excuse me while I get exceptionally immature with that one. <laughs> but anyway. And so the bullshit goes on. And on it most certainly went too. Each day, it felt like the mental anguish I was facing over the whole situation couldn't possibly get worse. But still, the weight always managed to increase with every new delay anyway. And it's December 12th, it's the middle of winter. I keep having worse days. It's like, you think you can hit a low and then life teaches you it can get lower. But anyway, so he's taken the Gladue and run with it. 
they took his hook and now he's reeling and reeling and he's told a complete fabrication. He's completely disowned our family and said that he was adopted into them and that he is Métis of the Wolf Clan and even goes on to say that he was sexually abused when he was a child by random men coming in and out of his cabin. And they used to have fur coats and weird blankets with colors on them. Yes, because it's the 1800s and we're talking about fur trades here. He went on the internet and did all kinds of research and just pumped his story to the sky. <laughs> I'm... <laughs> there aren't words. I went to see the crown yesterday. She met me on a Sunday, which was kind of interesting, and the police officer was there too. And uh, I got to read this Gladu report statement thing. And I was just, I was already having a terrible day. Stressed out about the court. And then I find out he's completely lied about his entire history. So I was in shock. I cried right away. Had a terrible night. I'm so done with all of this. Luckily, the Crown has pointed out that a lot of the things he said don't line up, that his storyline is all over the place, and in previous reports about his life, the details don't line up at all. So, hopefully the judge isn't a fool, and he doesn't get away with this, we'll see. <laughs> but the Gladu Report writer in London, she don't give no shits. Either that or she doesn't have any guidelines because she did not reference anything. She had no proof for a single word he said, and she wrote the report anyways. And they don't do that in Toronto. If they can't prove it, they don't write it. So I'm obviously a little bit traumatized by all this, but I guess we'll go in and find out. Is this a complete waste of our time? Is it gonna be delayed again? And though I walked in trying to fool myself into thinking there was some other possible outcome, in reality, I knew I was only going to be met with more disappointment surprised that it didn't happen, right? No, nope, we shouldn't be. As exactly expected, the judge went on to say that all Gladue reports are self-reported, so they can't just dismiss it. So he's given time to get proof. So they're going to be probing to try and get his birth certificate to basically prove where he was born, which he's claiming doesn't exist, which is a lie. So. It was kind of terrifying because the fucking judge, the way he talks, he seemed like he was genuinely considering the Gladue report valid at first, and we were all really upset and scared, but then he acknowledged that there was a lot of conflict between the pre-sentence report and the Gladue report. So he's given us until January to try to get a birth certificate or some kind of proof that he's lying, basically, and that the Gladue report should not be considered. And his lawyer is putting forward that he just couldn't imagine a man going to that much trouble. Are you fucking serious? This is your, are you kidding me? This is your argument? You realize your person's being charged with sexual exploitation, right? Of a child, right? Yeah, no? Okay. Anyways, nice argument there. And he's like, the doctor says in these previous doctor reports that he has a bad memory. You'd have to have a really good memory to pull this off. Right, because he hasn't been acting all of his health problems. Okay. So moving on from that detail, He's just like, this man would have to be very clever and have a really good memory to pull this off, and I just couldn't imagine that. Seriously? So anyway, they concluded that they basically weren't going to do anything today. He took uh, the pre-sentence report and the Gladue report as evidence, as well as, huh, he brought in six letters of reference for his character. How much you want to bet that none of these people know he has sexually exploited a child? Mm -hmm. Anyways. So that's been submitted as evidence as well. And they've basically decided they're gonna give themselves a holiday. Nobody ever does anything between Christmas and New Year's, as they say. And they haven't picked a final date because the douche face is like, oh, I'm not in London to my convenience. So I just don't know what day I can come. Sorry. And he was like saying January 17th and then he came back and was like, oh, what about February 27th? Are you fucking kidding me? Do you care at all how long this is taking? No? Okay, great. On it continues. An utter waste of everyone's life and time. Canadian courts. Courts in general. The law. It's a bunch of garbage and folly. If you think it works, you know nothing about it. In the end, January 20th ended up being the next chosen date, making it yet another torturous six-week wait to endure. 
But this wait was quite different from all the previous ones because in this past proceeding, I actually requested that the restraining order be removed. I had concluded that in dropping it, I could hopefully speak with my adoptive father about him getting therapy, as well as me taking care of our family dog while he was incarcerated. But he sadly proved to be much harder to communicate with than I had hoped. Well, happy inauguration day. <laughs> uh, so if you weren't familiar with the date of that, January 20th. There's been a lot of development. I've actually spoken with him. He believes his own shit, oh my God. He's like, acting like everything he's saying is completely 100% the truth. So he's trying to push that like, all the things he's saying in the Gladue report are true and real. Even talking to me in private. So he's clearly got a lot wrong and he needs help bad. And he doesn't seem too interested in getting it either. But the point is what he's done is being recognized. So upon all this, I, as I mentioned, suggested they look for a birth certificate and they did and they found it. And it was like exceptionally last minute. It showed up yesterday, but the point is they found it. So I get to learn what that means to the judge. And on top of the birth certificate, it's supposed to be final submissions today. I have reason to believe it will actually happen. But I mean, hey, we've been surprised so many times. We should expect the worst, right? In the end, I really don't have to go to all these court dates. So something to know if you ever have to go to a court date yourself or be involved with this. You don't have to go to all of them, but yeah. Let's fucking hope this is the last one. I mean, let's keep our hopes realistic and be aware that it might not work out. In the end, one way or another, it is January 2017 and he pled guilty in March 2016. So if you think the legal system works, <laughs> like I keep saying, you're taking it for granted. It's not working, it's just, I don't know, what you call it, limping along? Being a leprous limb that's still there, but mostly dead? <laughs> it's not working. This is not an example of it working. And it gets so much worse than this. Broken system, indeed. And now we wait in the victim witness office. I've been dealing with a lot of anxiety, but increasingly less, I guess, because I'm just getting used to this all. That's not a good thing but anxiety attacks have become a much more prevalent thing the last month, so yay mental health and uh, being held in suspense like this will do that to a person. Thankfully, the wait in the office wasn't too long, but once we got up into the courtroom, we came to learn that the proceedings would easily make up for that. My mood was a damn yo-yo. So, ha, uh, that was the longest I've ever spent in a courtroom. I mean, well, okay administrative court aside. It was about two hours. There was a lot of me like having to remind myself to pay attention <laughs> because his lawyer just like droned on and on and on about these different cases that he was referring to that should be given consideration because they're so similar to him. Particularly pointing out that all these disabled people were given probation instead of time in jail because uh, they're disabled and obviously they can't be accommodated in jail. And <laughs> It was, it was pretty infuriating for me, but it was oh, such an emotional roller coaster. Like, wow. At first, I was feeling like surprisingly okay, like not nervous, even giggling a little bit with Shane talking about stuff for the fact that it's inauguration day. Oh God. But then I had to go to the washroom right as it started, of course. So I like went as quick as I could, and then came back, and everything was started. And Mary had started into the birth certificate, which was the first piece of matter. She was like, yeah. So we found the birth certificate and it clearly states that he was born in Timmins, and it clearly states his parents' name, and that he is fucking white. <laughs> that his heritage is Italian and English, which is a very white person, <laughs> not native. To which his lawyer's retort was, well, my instructions are that he says that isn't him. That is some other guy. Which I knew. I just fucking knew he was gonna do that. And then yeah, he just droned on and on about all these different cases. And then he actually, he goes so far as to say that my victim impact statement, the fucker, he says that it goes too far into talking about things that are above and beyond the crime. I didn't, can we just point out that I didn't get to say a single physical injury that he did to me? Not one. Like, they blacked out so much. A whole fucking page. <laughs> And he still has the audacity to say that there's things in there that aren't submittable? Oh, fucking shove it up your ass. 
So that was pretty infuriating. Like, I'm still shaking, and I was shaking pretty bad. As I mentioned, I removed the restraining order so that I could communicate with him. And in the two very brief conversations we had, he made it clear that he wasn't going to be getting therapy. But anyways, his lawyer had the fucking audacity to use that as an argument that we were healing. And thus he was showing remorse and things were moving in a positive direction because I unusually removed the restraining order. Oh, fuck you. No. I, I couldn't handle that one. I like flipped out and I was just like, right, somehow because I'm empathetic, that has anything to do with him. And I like burst out of the fucking courtroom. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't take that. I couldn't, just, I couldn't. So anyway. I needed to be calmed in the hallway. Tia, the police officer, came out and calmed me and then Shane was just like, stop, you need to stop. <laughs> to which I was clearly not capable. <laughs> but um, I eventually calmed myself enough to get back in there because I wanted to find out what was going on. And his lawyer droned on and on and on about all these different cases that he should consider. And then uh, it was Mary's turn for submissions. And she obviously first addressed all the things that he said and like was like, I humbly disagree sort of thing. And then repeated, I think like three different times about the birth certificate. And at the very end, oh, the judge said to him, do you want to say anything to add to this before I go? You'll be given one more chance during sentencing, but you can say something now. And he took the, he fucking took the opportunity to act all like, disoriented and arms oh, oh, I can't understand what did you say I I I'm sorry I just I just want to say I'm sorry oh my god I'm sorry I'm being super mocky and like really immature I'm feeling very emotional right now but he, he just put on a huge act and like wasted five minutes of our time basically but uh, after that the judge made it clear again that he was not doing the sentencing today he was just taking submissions and he told us to come back on February 24th well over a month from now but we should be used to that by now, to do the sentencing, and then, and then he finally did something to make me like him. I mean, I've just been so upset with this judge with the way things have been going, and I've held him responsible a lot because he has been accommodating himself so much, and I'm just like, yeah, you care. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he uh, finished off by saying, uh, just to inform you, sir, you will be incarcerated. I just haven't decided how long, but you should prepare yourself and your affairs for the fact that on the 24th, you will be arrested as of that day. And oh my god, the relief. I was just like, oh, oh, yes, thank you. Thank you for telling us that. Thank you for not making me wait to know that. One way or another, he has dragged this out for almost a full year after pleading guilty, but he is unquestionably going to jail. So, there's that at least. I don't know if that's validation or just relief that it's finally over. Cause like, I never really cared about him going to jail per se. I just wanted him to get help. And we all know that's not possible now, so. At least whatever he did is going to be recognized. And uh, maybe with time, he'll get help, who knows. In the meantime, yet another month of waiting. Waiting, 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 always waiting. And this was quite possibly the hardest waiting period for me yet. Not just because it was almost a full year since he had pled, but very specifically because of learning about his past offenses during the submissions hearing. He had told me he went to jail for a bar fight in the year 2000, but I learned in truth that he had been charged with assault against a six-year-old little girl. And with this, I was forced to realize that I wasn't just a one-time mistake this person had made, but actually the second victim to a repeat offending pedophile who had manipulated my need for love just to use me. I don't think I had ever been more suicidal than in the few weeks before his final sentencing date, trying to cope with the reality of the whole situation. Can't actually believe it's the 24th. For you, it's just a snap between videos. <sighs> For me, I had to live it. So at this point, a lot of grieving has been done, but I still need some closure. <laughs> so that's why we're going in today. We're gonna go basically find out if he shows up because my next biggest fear is that he runs or as I keep saying, that he does some medical thing where he basically faints or goes to the hospital or does something dramatic and says he can't come in. He'll be arrested one way or the other, but it'll be a stressful situation, so hopefully he shows up and it all goes smoothly. So ultimately, I'm just anxious for this to all be done. I started it really wanting to help him and try to recover whatever family we might have left and in the end he made it clear that he's just really messed up and 
lonely and because he can't be in control, he doesn't want anything to do with me. One thing I did have to realize is no matter how much time he gets, which won't be much, it'll never be enough. So it doesn't matter. The point is that I did what I could. So, I'm gonna go find out what happened and hopefully not freak out. Though we ended up arriving rather early, so we sat outside the courtroom for a bit, waiting for the doors to be unlocked. Now I'm just sitting here thinking about all the many, many different things I wanna say to him. And I've talked to my therapist about the fact that I really wanted to say, in particular, that he'll never find anybody to be as loyal to him as I was, or I tried to be. But over the week I've thought about it, and she said you should really think about that before you go ahead with it, because I think that's just an emotional response to your abuse. And she's basically right. I initially thought it would be really fulfilling for me, but the more I think about it, the more I realize that it's not. It's no matter what I say, I, what I actually want is for him to understand my pain or certain things that I'm feeling, or I want him to understand that he's the one losing out, because I feel like I am <sighs> in a lot of ways. And I don't like that, but it doesn't matter what I say. I've learned a lot over the last few years of this hell, and one of the things is you can say all the English words that you want, and it doesn't matter if the other person understands English, it doesn't mean they're going to interpret and get your message. And especially not when they're mentally ill like him, like most abusers. So I just sort of have to accept that it's healthier for me long term, and just better overall that I not say anything, just let the day proceed. But as I'm sure many know, it's really hard. Me, another hour or so, and then we'll see what life has to give. So once again, the proceedings ended up being longer than expected, but I did at least reasonably anticipate the disappointment that would follow. So, oh, it's over. The judge basically summarized the entire case and it took forever. And uh, as we were later discussing with Mary, he wasn't so good at saying some of his writings, so it was a little frustrating. But as he was summarizing the different bits about the case, there was a number of points where he really started to upset me, and I was like having a panic attack at certain points because he was summarizing the defense's submissions on the years that he should do, which was two years less a day. And that was so upsetting, I thought he was like proposing that as a thing. And the other big upset, unfortunately, was that he said he did take the Gladu as being authentic and does believe that he has native heritage, which is just garbage. And the biggest upset about that is that he lied in that Gladu so much, claiming shit like that he dated my mother, which is bullshit, that he like drove me to parties, bullshit. So just, uh, it's really frustrating that he basically took that report and thus those lies as like some level of truth. But he also did say with that, that considering the gravity of the case, Although he does take that as true evidence, he didn't feel it had any genuine impact on the actual end sentence because he didn't feel it was relevant, I guess, or in any way was an explanation to offer excuse for his actions, I guess, something along those lines. So it is really upsetting that he's taking advantage of the Gladue principles, and that the judge took those seriously, but he has no ability to appeal that matter, at least, because the judge did say that he considers that true evidence and just didn't feel that it had any significance to changing the sentence. In the end, as I said, no matter what they do, it's not going to be satisfying, and I am dissatisfied, but it was expected, at least. He got five years for the sexual exploitation charge and 90 days for this love Miss scar right here. And absolutely no recognition for any of my other scars or abuse. But the judge did make a point of acknowledging that he realized the impact was very deep and extending and ongoing right now on me. So that was nice, I guess. Oh yeah, they also gave him like a 10 year weapon ban and it's on the sex offender list for 20 years, which was really upsetting because I'm like, oh, there's a time limit to that? Why isn't he just like on it forever? But okay, great, well. That's just the way it is. It's really hard to say how I feel in the end. Going through that whole experience was torture. There's no better word for it. I didn't get out what I went in for. I went in to try and rebuild my family and get my adoptive father help, and I just lost my family all in itself. But what it really made me realize is that he was never capable of being family towards me because he's so mentally ill. I do still believe that abusers can recover, 
and unfortunately he's just not one of them. He's too far gone. And uh, depending on your purpose of going into court, no matter what, I do think you're going to come out dissatisfied. But when it's someone this ill who's definitely going to reoffend, you are still doing the right thing reporting because you're getting their illness recognized and you're hopefully at least reducing their ability to access the public in different ways and thus hurt more people. And I do feel that the Victim Witness Office needs more work in being assisting to victims, but one way or another, his mental illness and crimes were recognized. And that's what you need to realize is important when going through the courts, but definitely know you're not going to get what you want out of it because everybody's idea of justice is different. We did this video to provide support to others going through this experience, so I hope you did find it supportive. And if you would like to contact me to get more information about the experience or just more support if you're going through this or are an abuse victim, please do feel free to contact me in the email that I leave in the description below. And uh, as I say at the end of all my other videos, please do join me again next week or sometime soon where I try again to share a little something I've learned or experienced in life.